Hi, everybody. So, yeah, I'm going to talk about how to stop being generic and um, enjoy enjoy my little eye tracker. So, I see a lot of, like, isekai comics these days, lots of isekai manga. Everybody's doing, like, the whole uh, fantasy. You know, they're always doing the, these fantasy isekai, and you have, like, the OP protagonist who gets, like, a freaking harem and... It's all very formulaic, and it, it's become quite generic. It's because it's it's because, and the reason why there's it's so generic is because number one, this stuff is successful. Number two, you don't have to really think; you can just go straight for the formula. And I think what we have is we've got a lot of people. There's a lot of people who want to work, they want to make a manga, but they ain't got any good ideas, and they're like, well. Unfortunately, we're not going to have some great ideal person with a great story coming along to give me, you know, ideas and world building that is going to make my generic isekai non-generic. And that's that's just where we're at. We're we're just kind of unfortunately we have a bit of a shortage of good storytellers and and good world builders. So so I want to talk about, you know, how to stop being generic or rather Maybe a better way to put this is how to, you know, how to invent. This is the problem. We're out of inventors. We're out of people who can come up with cool ideas and cool world builds. And and right now, um, basically, you know, everybody's like doing copying. Everybody's just copying each other. This is the problem. So we got a lot of these, you know, people who write the stories and you know, the light novelists and whatnot, and they just read other light novelists' work, and then they're just copying, 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 copying. And and this is what turns something into something generic, is that they take something that was successful once, and then they copied it and copied it and copied it. And unfortunately, you know, if you take... For those of you who know what a photocopier is, if you take a copy of a copy and you run it through it, it just starts to degrade. So what we're seeing is a lot of uh, inbreeding, copying, degradation occurring. And so I know it's like, okay, so so just, just so you know... We're not going to like suddenly start drawing a whole bunch of stuff and then you're just going to be amazing at this at the end of it. Um, it's not. And if that's what you want, go away. I don't want you here. Go away. Go away. Because the problem, one of the reasons why people are generic now is because they don't take the fucking trouble. They don't take the goddamn time. And if you don't want to take the goddamn time, doors that way. Out, out you go. Go. Give me a down vote. Down like a, a dis. Shit, they got rid of the dislike counter. Well, it's okay. Look. Whatever. Give me a dislike anyway, and out you go. <laughs> All right? I won't waste your time, and you won't waste my time. So for those of you who are still around and actually want to break this cycle of being generic, and you want to invent things, and you want to come up with your own ideas because no great stories are coming along, no great story writers are coming along and jumping into your lap. Um, giggity. This is, let's talk about how to actually invent something that is not of the mainstream and how to, how to actually get out of this. So if you're inventing things, it means that, well, it doesn't just come out of nowhere. It comes from your prior knowledge. So being knowledgeable. And being knowledgeable, it's like, oh, wow, I went to school and I have a degree in all of this stuff and I know everything I need. It's like, no, that's not how it works. The way that you become knowledgeable is actually, it comes from curiosity. And curiosity means a desire for... <laughs> All kinds of stupid knowledge, like, you know, I wonder how the hell they put these USB sticks together. What 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 is even in these things, right? Like, how did they make those things work? Can, can I find out how they're manufactured? Can I see some takedown videos of, like, them disassembling these things so we can see what's inside? That's what curiosity is. Curiosity is is the pursuit of knowledge without actually, you know, being judgmental about saying, oh, we'll never need to know that. It's like, you just... I guess, I guess the problem is that probably when most people were kids and they asked their parents, "Hey, mom, you know why this? Hey, dad, why that? You know what what, what happens when this thing? You know, it's like we're, when we, kids are naturally curious about things, and then the parents eventually get sick of answering their questions, and they say, "Fuck off, stop asking me questions, and I'm not going to answer them." And the schools also say, "Well, here's what we're going to have to, you to learn for today," and you know they decide what it is that you should learn. So all the curiosity has basically been stamped out of you, and um. And so, you know, 
now that you're adults and you're hopefully you're adults and you're you're on your you know left to your own devices um you're gonna have to figure out this stuff for yourself you're gonna have to become interested in just the things around you because you've got the blinders on and you're gonna have to take the blinders off you're gonna need to want to know what what's going on inside things what is inside this pen I don't know. Let's unscrew it. Oh, there we are. Little Parker pen. There's a cartridge. What's inside the cartridge? It will probably make a mess, but I imagine it's a pressurized cartridge. There's uh, some gas on the back of these things. I just happen to know that there's like, it's a there's a, there's basically pressurized gas here. There's a little plunger. And that pressurized gas is forcing that plunger down and there's all this ink here the reservoir of ink is in here and then there's a ballpoint so basically this allows this thing to write upside down right then on the back of this thing there's a well there's a spring uh, and i push that that thing comes back out there's a little ratchet here so that that little ratchet engages with the mechanism up here on the there's this thing spring loaded so that's that little ratchet allows the pen to pop in and out every time you click like this this is what i mean right is that you want to know what's inside things and how do they work how to like if you want to invent you want to invent like new weapons you want to invent new armor and, and new monsters and stuff you start you start to need you you need to understand form and function and you got to understand you know how to put these things together and, and how to take them apart and put them back together without spare parts like this is this is the problem we're out of inventors we're out of people you know, we need people who, who can who can pick things up and, you know, wonder what the hell's going on inside them. And I've been doing this since I was a kid. Like, I, I've always been disassembling stuff and putting, <laughs> looking around with them and that kind of thing. That, that's what you got to be like. That's the kind of person you got to be. <sighs> so, yeah. Curiosity, if you've got curiosity and you're constantly, you know, as, a, as just... A way of being you're always looking into things you're always trying to study things you're always trying to figure out what's inside it what makes it tick um this is a problem because like again i grew up in a time when when a lot of the computers were not as slick and packaged as these cell phones were right these things very very powerful more powerful than any computer i used when i was like when i was a kid and at the same time, you know, you want to use a thing, you just like hit the button and then use like a freaking fingerprint thing. And then it's like you poke and jab at it like this. Computers weren't always this way. You know, we used to have to like swap out. I, the, my first computer, we had, we had a, a tape drive. You put a cassette tape into the thing. You had to type commands to tell it what to do. You know, you know, like command prompts like this is like when we was it uh, win our CMD, right? Like. These command prompts how many people actually use these things right like who knows what batch files are it's like this is i wouldn't even call this hacking like this this stuff was like common knowledge right so the problem is that you all all of you just talk to youtube and use these computers with these nice slick little interfaces and you never ever bothered to open these things up and see what was inside. You've never used a computer that was simpler that required you to actually, you know, dick around with the interior with the with the gudgeons of the thing. So if you're not somebody who ever gets into, you know, gets past that 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 exterior shell that never opens up the pen to see what's inside it, right? You're never gonna be a knowledgeable person. Right? You're never gonna be somebody who knows what's going on inside, and you'll never be able to come up with your own ideas when it comes to like inventing inventing monsters and creatures and that sort of thing. It's just that's the mindset you need. And if you don't want to develop that mindset and if it seems like too much of a pain in the ass, out you go. Out. Take the door. Give me a dislike and, and leave. Go away. Because that's what it takes to be generic. Like, you know, if you want to be generic, out you go. <laughs> it's like if, that, that that's that's the price. The price of being able to come up with cool ideas and and you know new things means you had you have to have a good mind for learning, and the good mind for learning is not 
one that makes you good in school. I did. I always had terrible grades because school was too fucking boring and I couldn't stand sitting there while people just handed knowledge to me. This is the, another problem, right? People just want things simple and just handed to them. Oh, I don't want to know how to use the computer and learn all those stupid commands. Like, just, just give me a nice little obelisk and I can just mash my fingers on the screen to understand it. That's the problem. That's the problem with people. That's, that's why... That's why there's so much generic crap these days. People don't, people never say, no, damn it, I want, I want something that, that I can actually, you know, write commands in and, and, and I can see what's going on inside it and I can like program and create my own scripts and, and maybe, you know, write an app for, an, for a phone for once. So, yeah, you know, stop being such a consumer. Stop being as somebody who always has to have a fucking faceplate on the thing. All right, so as a reward for sticking with me this far, let's talk about systems design. So if you're going to be doing systems design, this means that you deal with the solving of needs, the fulfilling. You're going to fulfill a bunch of needs. So, all right. Um, I had an idea of something that I wanted to talk about, which was actually about, just as an example, how about a missile launch, you know, uh, a missile drone. We're going to invent a missile drone robot. How big's the fucking thing? No, what's a better question? Why do we even need this thing? What are we killing? What are we killing? What's a target? What is it? Elephants? Right? Are you dinosaurs? Other drones? Uh, incoming nukes? So, right off the bat, if you're going to go and design some kind of missile drone, you got to figure out what the fuck you need the thing for. And you'll notice that I didn't say, oh, let's go look at other missile drones. I said, you know, this, this is what it means when you get into, like, the design stuff. You start to, you have to fulfill needs. What do you need the damn thing for? People on the ground? Walking robots? Tanks? Attack helicopter? Attack choppers, right? So all of these things are going to require different payloads. So if you're killing, you know, elephant, you're going to need you're going to need to be able to carry missiles that can, you know, anti-elephant missiles. You're going to need anti-dinosaur missiles. You're going to need anti-drone missiles. You're going to need anti, you know, anti-missile missiles. So this is very important. So you got to figure out what's your target. Let's pick one of these things. I'm just going to hold the up key. Oh, or actually, no, hold on. I think, I think there's a way for me to lottery this thing. Uh, okay, let's just get rid of what we don't need. Oh, wait, I got it. We're going to take this thing. We're going to jam it over on this side, and I'm just going to hold the up arrow. Ah, uh, it won't cycle. Darn it. Dang it, dang it, dang it, dang it. I was hoping I could just hold the up arrow and then close my eyes and then open my eye. Okay, fine. Uh, let's see what's cool. How about other drones? All right, there. The purpose of this missile drone is simply to kill other drones. <clears throat> you have to make decisions, right? This is one of those decisions. So we're going to blow up other drones. Specifically, what kind of other drones? Other missile drones. <laughs> uh, other oh, or maybe maybe the thing is that you're trying to kill other assassination drones so so basically you've got some drone that's coming to kill 
a VIP and you're trying to shoot down that that kind of and and again this all comes down to asking questions you got to ask questions and this is why I said that if you're if you're not curious if you if you're not good at asking questions uh, there's a door because you don't have what you need you don't have what you need to be able to ask the right questions to be able to invent things inventing things is not about coming up with answers it's about asking questions So, right, if we're killing other drones, then, and in this case, maybe there are other missile drones, or maybe there are other drones with, uh, with guns. Okay, are they flying, right? It's kind of important to know. Are, are we targeting things that are on the ground or in the air? Very often, if you look at the military, the military is always, whenever they design missiles they're always talking about atg or they're talking about ata air to ground air to air uh you know uh, ground to sea you know uh, ship to ship ship to air so there's basically there's ground or land sea and air so it you pick two out of those three and then you can get any combination. So if you're doing air to air to air, that means like airplanes shooting airplanes. You know, air to ground means airplanes shooting things on the ground. You know, air to ship. Now here's the other thing, right? It's like, is your target moving, or is your target stationary? This is why if your if your target's like a bunker, right? That that's like a stationary target, heavily armored. So that's why I say, you know, it's good to know. Is it an air to air missile? If it's an air to air missile, whatever you're shooting up, like. Whatever missile that you're using to, sh to do air-to-air -air has to be highly maneuverable because the enemy pilot's going to be trying to deke that fucking missile. And your missile has to, you know, be able to handle not getting rope doped Then you got to think about things like, you know, the distance to the target. So I would call this engagement. Right? There's engagement distance. There's window so window means like window of time how much time do you have to kill that thing do you have an hour to kill the thing you know if you launch a cruise missile at, at a ground target you know don't worry that that building's not going anywhere right you launch a cruise missile it'll take a few minutes or whatever you know you launch a cruise missile from like an aircraft carrier or from well actually no aircraft carriers don't launch missiles um from a destroyer so you launch a cruise missile from a destroyer and the thing takes a good few minutes and it's going to strike some building. It's okay, the building's not going anywhere. And of course, the, the cruise missile can carry a big fucking payload. Cruise, miss, cruise missile can cruise over the ground at low height, so it can't be detected by radar until the last fucking second. And then take out the target, right? So the thing is, that what's your time window? Right, because you can't use a cruise missile to kill, like, a, a, an attack heli. The thing about the cruise missile is that the cruise missile, which is meant to destroy a large land target, must carry something called a payload. All right, so payloads are, are a result. They're a result in the question of asking what kind of target. Your payload, it's like, you know, it's it's literally the warhead. That's that is what you have to carry. So if if we're talking about missile drones, we're launching missiles, you'll notice the first thing I'm talking about with the missile drone is not the actual robot. I'm talking about the payload of the robot. The robot carries missiles. Now I'm talking about the missile. And now not only am I not only talking not about the missile, I'm not talking about the rocket booster or the engine or the shape of the missile or how big the fucking thing is. I'm talking about the warhead, the thing at the very tip, because the thing is that the end goal of the missile is to get this chunk of explosives or this warhead or whatever the hell is in the tip of this thing from here to that motherfucker over there. This is this is like the kind of question that you that that ancient weapons designers had to ask at the very fucking beginning when they made bows and arrows or in spears and stuff they're like i have a very sharp piece of flint we had to like take a rock and we had to nap the thing until it became really really sharp and now i got to get this thing into the into that beast over there not just into that beast over there but into the vitals of that beast because if you don't get that fucking little sharp rock into the heart of that thing it's not going to stop it's not going to stop it in time it, it might bleed to death somewhere in the forest where we can't find the fucking thing right so 
warheads very important, targeting very important. You know, this is all about answering the question of how to get this payload to the target. That, that you know, how do we get it there? So the the payload, you know, how do we? There's the warhead. So the warhead could be if we're killing other drones. Maybe the warhead doesn't even have to be explosive, right? The warhead could be explosive. So there's a bunch of ways we can do this. Um, we got to think about all the different ways in which we can ways in which we can destroy the other warhead, the other drone. We could EMP that motherfucker. We could have an electromagnetic pulse. So the things the warhead doesn't even have to be right. It doesn't even have to make contact. We can just cause an EMP explosion, uh, an EMP discharge next to the thing and fry the circuitry. That, that's one thing we could do. We could EMP that guy. We'll talk about the specifics of EMP later on. Um, then you could have something where, oh, now your guys are all, you guys are all getting on a list because you watch this video. Sorry. Um, so the next thing is, the, is maybe we could conventionally blow the thing up. Maybe not just blow the thing up. We got to understand the construction of the other drone. What is that other, what do drones typically have? Like quadcopters, right? Quad, quad they got fucking propellers, right? So maybe we can go act. So what, what the EMP does, the EMP targets the circuitry. Right, so maybe this is what I should do: is that the EMP is the answer to circuitry, because EMP fries circuitry, propellers, cameras. Right. So if we're talking about other drones, then all of these are things; these are problems posed by a drone. Or I should say these are ways in which we can gain a solution over the drone. We can either have a solution that targets the circuitry, targets propellers, targets cameras of the drone, targets the antennae. There's all kinds of things that, that are necessary to keep a drone afloat. How about the airframe or the hull? The, 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 the hull or the chassis, right? Just break the fucking thing apart and make it fall out of the sky. Battery. Right? Lots of things go into making a drone. And all of these things are necessary for keeping the thing in the air. You know, it, it, our cameras, uh, sensors. So sensors include things like gyros and whatnot. And then, of course, there's just the very air around it. Right? So you want to foul propellers? You could have a missile whose purpose is just to shoot out A whole bunch of metal balls with strings on them. <laughs> okay? It's just a bursting charge. It shits out a bunch of metal balls with strings on them, and then they get tangled up in the propellers, and the thing goes, blah, 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 and it goes out of the ground. Okay? This is how you invent things, right? If you start to understand your target, we can figure out, you know, a warhead, a special kind of warhead. Cameras and sensors. Oil. Oil mist. Oil mist will fog up the cameras. Um, it'll, you know, get on the lens and kind of foul it. It could be a paint mist even. Great way to foul sensors. Oh, great stuff. And not only that, I mean, like, the, the not only are there the propellers, there's also little motors, Right, so the, so unless if those motor drives aren't sealed, like a paint mist will will get in there, and you know a glue mist, yeah, we'll just spooge that fucker. Right, so just burst a bursting of glue will 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 will, will bring that thing down. You know, enough chewing gum will get that thing down. Antenna, right? Break, you know, snip them, um, break them off. Now th this one. I guess if the thing loses its antenna, then it may have some autonomous. So autonomous meaning that instead of antenna are, are things that you get for remotely guided. You know, if it's if it does recon, then it has to broadcast back home. If if, if it if it's remotely guided, then something will talk to it through the antenna and, and guide it. So antenna, I don't know. Antenna are a little bit tricky to to go after. They don't always have long aerials sticking out that you can go after. So that one's a bit of a tricky one. The airframe, the hull, and the chassis. Okay, if you're going after that, you need explosives. You either need explosives or you need kinetic bullets. Just good old bullets, you know, slugs. You know, hit them with something 
hard enough that breaks that, right? You, you need to break, you need to break that chassis. That's con and by the way, like a lot of conventional, most conventional um, attacks are through that. Vast majority of weaponry is like this general purpose, easy to make that stuff, like very cheap. Well, unless you get the military to do it, in which case they'll somehow find a way to make it cost like a zillion dollars. But the thing is that they will find a way to make it so that they can reduce the cost of it so that this way, when it means that they get more of the billion dollars. So yeah, absolutely. They're always trying to find a way to reduce the costs of the actual making of the thing so that that way they can pocket more of the, more of the leftover. Whatever's left, they can, they, they can funnel that stuff into there. They can pad their pockets a little more easily. Batteries, uh, again, batteries, probably same thing. Use, um, Kinetic projectiles. Air around the drone. Okay, so this one's kind of an odd one. Um, maybe a thermal barrack? Yeah, thermal barracks when you have base... that Thermal barracks are just... It's, it's a fuel mist. You spray a whole lot of fuel around it. You give it a light. Uh, did you know that thermal barracks... Like, Okay, so, so the neat thing about thermal barrack or... They're also known as FAE or fuel air explosives. Yeah, so basically, the thing about a lot of conventional explosives, and oh, you guys are getting on a list again. The video's been demonetized. It's okay, I never monetize any of my videos. So, the thing about explosives, conventional explosives, is that I think something like as much as 70% of the, of the mass of an explosive is actually oxidizer. Like if you want to blow something up, you need fuel and you need oxygen for combustion. And so you need like 70% of that, that, that damn thing. I can't even remember where I got that figure. Don't quote me on it. But a whole shit ton of, of that weight is actually based in oxidizers. And so what an oxidizer is, is an oxidizer is a chemical compound that when you combust it, it produces more oxygen. And the oxygen helps with that reaction of making a bigger... <laughs> But the thing is that the vast majority of the of the explosive tends to be oxidizer. And so that means that when you're sending the, the explosive up there, you know, you're sending not a little bit of fuel and mostly explosive. Uh, most, yeah, sorry, a little bit of fuel, ex which is the explodey stuff, the stuff that actually gives it the energy. But you're also sending it with a whole pa packet of its own oxygen. So in the case of an FAE, a fuel, expl a fuel air explosive, is that a lot of that, well, in the case of fuel, fuel air explosive is that there's no oxygen. You, you're only sending up purely fuel. And then what you do is you spray that stuff around in a mist. <laughs> you spray it around in a mist, and the oxygen comes from the surroundings. It comes from the air. So it means that you get to replace, you know, by weight, you get to replace a lot of that, that oxidizer with just more explosive fuel. And this is what they often use for, you know, blowing up tunnels and stuff. Whenever they want to blow up a tunnel... They, they use a, a thermobaric. They use something which blasts a mist of fuel in there, and then it uses the, the air within the tunnel. And when you get this explosion, you get kind of a weird explosion implosion. It's like you get an explosion first, and then an implosion that follows immediately afterwards. Oh, and the other neat thing about a thermobaric explosion is that these are all subsonic deflagrations. So there's, there's two terms. There's deflagration and there's detonation. A detonation means that it's an explosion that exceeds the speed of sound. A deflagration is an explosion that does not exceed the speed of sound. One of them is supersonic. Detonations are supersonic. Deflagrations are subsonic. In the case of an FAE, it is def it's a deflagration. It's a subsonic explosion. That means that if you were caught in a tunnel blast with a thermal barrier explosive, it would not knock you out. Very often, it doesn't knock people out. You get to be awake for the whole ride. <laughs> You get to be there for for the whole experience, and I tell you, it both it it blows and it sucks. It's pretty horrifying. It's pretty bad stuff. Yeah, so it's um, I th I think there's like some Geneva Convention stuff where like they they kind of wanted to do something about that. Don't worry, no one ever listen listen to the fucking Geneva Convention. They still use white phosphorus. So I know we're we're like this is this is not a straightforward exercise. You'll notice, right? Like there's a lot of getting into the weeds on things. And guess what? A lot of this stuff is probably new to a lot of you guys, right? And you're like, oh my God, holy cow. Like, this is what world building is, right? World building is when you literally start taking 
every single fucking thing and you start taking it apart to figure out what the hell's going on inside it. Right? It means that, yeah, you're going to become a very petty nerd. Very petty nerd. And you know what? Like, look, all of the greatest franchises, you know, a lot of all the greatest franchises that, that you that you know and you love are the result of petty nerds. All right. J.K. Rowling, Harry Potter, she was a she was a fucking petty nerd. You know, she'll talk about how there's like, you know, all the the things about how the, the wands are all different and, and they're made of a different core and like and, and right, she made a whole lot of lore and that she's a fucking petty nerd. All right. Uh, the Matrix, which you love, same deal, right? It's like they, they get into all this stuff about the agents and the hell of the list. That, that's world building. That's petty nerd shit. Uh, Star Wars, you know, God, they, they fucking go on and on about what's in the lightsabers and what makes, you know, what kind of crystals are going into a fucking blaster and like all the petty nerd shit. Okay. If you want to make a fandom, you want to make something that's like really worth like looking into and, and feels convincing. I won't say realistic. I'll say convincing. You got to be a fucking petty nerd. And, and that's what this is. This is petty nerdism. You, you don't just. You leave no rock unturned. You want to know what's going on. So, yeah. So, anyway, the, interestingly enough, the warhead here, this this is something which uh, I think if I control-click that and I right-click and I say insert a graphical link there, right? So, if you want to figure out what's in the warhead, you got to know about the target. And this these will help you an well, help answer that, that question. Then I talk about things like, you know, distance and time window. So distance and time window, these are going to affect things like your, the chariot. Okay. The missile is simply a flying chariot. It's a flying chariot whose sole purpose is to carry the warhead, the, the payload to the target. And I mean, it's not exactly, it, it's, a, it's a figurative speaking. It's a figure of speech. Uh, I'm, I'm, it's not exactly a, a horse-drawn carriage. Uh, that is certainly one way to get a payload to the target. Um, but the que question is, you know, how far and how fast? How far, how fast, and sometimes, you know, evasiveness. How evasive is your target? Because, you know, if the thing is able to get out of the way, like it, not for buildings, but I mean, if it's, a, if it's another vehicle or whatever, then you got to take into account the enemy's evasiveness. So this, you know, your chariot, how much, um, things like how far, how fast. So things like how far and how fast, well, if, if we're just going to, first we have to also pick one of these things, right? If we're going to kill it with a kinetic projectile, well then maybe we don't even need, we don't even need a missile. We just, we just shoot him with a bullet, bang, bang. Blow up some, some gunpowder, some smokeless powder, and then send, that, send a little round down that way. Right? If, if the thing is not that evasive, and, you know, and, and it's pretty close, and maybe we don't have a very long time window, actually, you want to know something. You ever heard of a CIWS? Oops. Right? CIWS stands for close in weapon system close in weapon system they put these things on aircraft carriers whenever there's missiles that are about to like strike these carriers they have these they have these things called CIWS they look like this they they have a big base so they sit on the aircraft carrier kind of like this and then they have a big phallic shape <laughs> And this thing hold, houses the radar, the radar stuff. This thing is just a big freaking radar dome, a ray dome. And then it's got like a big fucking Gatling gun. And it literally just has a machine gun go burr. And, and then after that, it's got like a big kind of like big joint here. And there's a swivel joint over here. Right. So this thing can, can, can turn around this way. And it can, and this joint here allows this thing to turn this way, up and down like that. That's a CIWS. So the thing is, if a missile comes in, the thing detects the the radar. It's a point defense system. The the radar detects the incoming missile. It just swivels around and goes, <laughs> and it shoots down the missile. Pretty fucking awesome stuff. These things can shoot down like artillery shells and and, and stuff. They're they're 
pretty fucking baller. And what are they shooting? They're shooting lead, you know, or I don't know. I think it's probably lead. They're just shooting bullets really, really fast. They're very awesome. You should look up military footage of a CW, CIWS. Those things are awesome. I think these things also, they have some of these which are not just tasked to, pro to protect aircraft carriers, but stationary bases as well, like military bases. These things are baller. And they just use good old-fashioned bullets. And bullets are just glamorized rock throwers. Except they don't shoot rock, they shoot lead. That's a little bit more precisely machined. <laughs> or casted. Okay, so consider that, right? If, if you don't have a big time window and your target is kind of very evasive or actually not that evasive, but, you know, the distance isn't that far, consider a CIWS. Go for something simple. Sometimes a missile, which is all guided and has all the heat seeking cable. It's like, something, you know, those things are really fucking expensive. They're like you know, $10,000 or like $100,000 a pop. They're fucking expensive. They are very expensive fireworks, these guided missiles, you know, they put a whole, they put a whole computer system and they, they make it very, very expensive. They're, 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 yeah. Sometimes you're, if, and that's another thing, right? You got to think about, um, in the case of your missile drone, right? This is also a chariot or the chariot, <laughs> right? Because the missile drone is the chariot for the missile, which is the chariot for with the warhead, right? This is why I'm talking about systems design, right? You're always fulfilling needs. In this case, you're having to fulfill the needs of another thing, which must fulfill the needs, which must fulfill the needs of another thing. So I'm just explaining to you how to be a really petty nerd, right? And only the petty nerds are left watching this video. The rest of them, they're the mainstream plebs who don't have the patience for this shit. And that's why the mainstream will always be this dribbling gruel because they don't have they don't have the their minds break down their minds can't withstand this this breakdown of of detail so yeah i mean it, we, we're, we you have to go into this stuff into like i, I think the phrase the, the phrase they use is into into it with autistic detail and i don't mean this like as a as a downside i'm saying this is this is the autist's time to shine that that petty that pettiness so yeah, okay. So the thing is that we can have there's CIWS. So this is if you if you don't have a problem with if your chariot for the chariot doesn't even have to move, if you're allowed to have a fixed emplacement, then that means that you can just make something a, a, a stationary thing that just shits out a lot of bullets, and the and, and and there's less constraint on you for having to make something which is highly mobile and very fast. You can. It's very cost effective, right? It means that this, these, these CIWS systems can be set up to just guard your base 24 seven. I think the only thing is that if you're putting them in the desert, so that's the other thing, environment. That's the only thing about the CIWS is that the CIWS relies on, you know, a bunch of joints that swivel and whatnot. And those joints must be sealed against dirt and dust and, and sand, especially sand. Right, because there's enough sandstorms which cause that stuff to clog up. It's going to have difficulty swiveling, and it needs to swivel very precisely. So you got to think about what's the hostile, hostile environment. You got to protect this thing. You got to worry about, you know, how is this thing going to handle over over the time. You got to think about things like what are the power requirements, or I would say what's the upkeep. Nuclear powered coal powered kind of electricity battery powered backups the power consumption yeah you know it's like uh, if it's electrical what's the source so the source it could be coal could be you know on site power generation so you know that you could have things like gasoline you got a generator going, blah, 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 you know, powering this thing. Battery. <laughs> right. So the thing is that ultimately electrical is the best thing for these kinds of devices. In, in, in these cases, so there's elect electrical, there's maintenance. Got to keep the thing running tip top. Got to keep the thing 
you know, maybe you have to periodically clean the clean the gudgeons, get the sand out of the fucking thing. And also, there's things like parts. Parts may wear out, have to be replaced. Ah, vibration, right? So you got things like um, sand, dust, fouling. I would call this fouling. So fouling is something you got to watch out for from, from things like sand and dust. You've also got problems of things like uh, corrosion. So there's that. Vibration's another one. Vibration is much bigger than people expect. Sometimes if you put that thing on the deck of an aircraft carrier and there's any en engines going burr, 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 and there's a lot of vibration, like nuts and bolts will gradually vibrate and turn loose. Right, you may have to apply some Loctite glue to those things to keep them, keep them from from unwinding. So vibration, big one, really, really big one. And the thing about vibration is that sometimes you even have vibration that there's a subset of vibration called resonance. <laughs> so sometimes you've got if if the vibration is matching in the same frequency as the propagation of a vibration through the overall structure, you get resonance, and the whole thing can shake itself apart. Like, really really bad you got to watch out for resonance um a, a really good example of this would be uh, i think in in the uk there was a bridge uh, in fact just bridges in general is that bridges have a resonance to them and there's not only that not only is a, a, a problem where every single bridge has a resonant frequency but here's the funny thing is that when they send an army to go walking across a bridge they all have to break step because very often what armies do, they go brump, 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 brump in a march. They march in stride. When they all go across a bridge, a really funny thing happens. When they take a step, they cause the bridge to go one direction. The, the bridge gets shoved in a direction. And then the bridge shoves back. And when it shoves back, it alters the, the, foot, the footfalls of the troops. And they react, and they begin altering their step to match that shove back. And then they step, and it shoves the bridge. And then the bridge shoves back, and it causes them to alter their stride until eventually their step will match up with the resonant wobble of the bridge. And when that happens, they can actually cause the bridge to collapse. And it has happened a number of times. And very often on bridges um, during like World War II or World War I, they would actually have signs that says, you know, you must break stride. Uh, that if you're marching across, you have to break stride with each other when you're going across this bridge. And uh, I think recently even there was like a bridge in the UK that had uh, an issue with that. When they first opened the thing up and let all these people start, you know, all these plebs started walking across the bridge. They were causing the bridge to start wobbling. And then eventually the bridge began to wobble back and people began matching up their footfalls unconsciously. And then the bridge was like, they, they had to close the fucking bridge. They had to stop because... <laughs> because I, the, the, the fucking thing like the, the plebs were, were causing the thing to shake apart so yeah vibration you know vibration and resonance really really it, it's they are real things so you see what I mean right you got to be knowledgeable and you got to be curious and and the only reason why we're so plagued by genericism is because people aren't curious anymore they've been this is what generations of schooling has done generations of living in facilities that hand you the knowledge and get you used to having knowledge handed to you you don't ask questions anymore and so you it's just resulted in a, a whole lot of people who just become really shitty storytellers because they can only tell each other stories <laughs> okay so the chariot for the chariot that means that we got to think about things like um how big is the drone allowed to be actually i would call this footprint Right, so footprint means things like how big is the drone allowed to be? How much is the drone allowed to weigh? Right, that's it. Or actually, I would say how much space? How much drone? How much space is the drone allowed to take up? 
So basically, we're we're, we're figuring out how thick the freaking drone is. You know, we don't want to make it obviously that the thicker the drone is, the easier it is to slap it with a missile. Okay, you know, you're trying to make a drone that's not too thick. So footprint, and and the thing is that the footprint is of two things. It's it's basically drone plus payload. So it's payload of missiles. And the thing is that the drone weighs a certain amount when it's full, weighs a certain amount when it's empty. The drone needs to be able to maneuver while it's full. I don't know if the drone needs to maneuver when it's empty because you may make disposable drones. You can make a, dr a drone that goes up, blows its load all over the enemy, doesn't even give it a towel, and then it just falls out of the sky and blows up, right? So the enemy can't have it. And, and it doesn't have to fly back to base. And nobody can follow the drone back to, you know, find out where base is. So, you know, disposability. A lot of things, you know, just meant to be disposable. So those are probably the, the, the main factors. Also, you know, maneuverability. O-E-U-V-R-E-A-B-I-L crazy word okay okay let's let's just right click that spelling okay so this is the american spelling yeah that's fine maneuverability how much of the thing you know how how much how good does it have to be at at not just deking incoming rockets but you know if it's too huffy and puffy to keep up with the target, then it's no good, right? It, it, like, the thing is that this thing still needs to be able to get the missiles close enough to the target. So you can almost think of this as, like, here's home base. Here's your drone. The drone has missiles. So really, the drone is the base for the missiles. The base is the base for the drone. The drone is the base for the missiles. And the missiles are the base for the payload, for the rockets. And then you finally have your target up there. And you're, we're ultimately just trying to get this thing, this little thing up there. Okay. So the thing is that the drone handles, you know, the, the, the large movement of just getting close enough, getting within the, the attack radius, right? Your missiles may have a, short attack, a shorter attack radius than your drone does. A shorter operating radius than your drone does. And then those missiles... Once the drone is within the operating radius, then then it can begin, you know, launching missiles at the target, right? And the missiles just have to, the missiles have their own little operating radius, which is, you know, missiles have their own operating radius of, of actually, correction, we're well within the radius. This is the operational radius of the missiles. And then the warheads themselves are, maybe only have a little explosive damaging, a kill radius, Right? Your missiles will have a little kill radius that's only like that. So we still have to be able to get the kill radius. Like that. And, if, and if, of course, if we're dealing with like a, a hail hydra type, you know, giant super carrier, well, then we got to make sure that the power plant of the carrier is hopefully within that, that kill radius, in which case if it isn't and it's like somewhere in, ensconced within the, the structure of, the, of the, the craft, well, then we, have, we better have enough penetration. All right. So, I mean, it's not just about, about the... It's not just about girth, like the length that actually matters. We need, you know, we need enough length <laughs> so that our girth can reach the, 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 the okay, all right, e enough, enough innuendo. <laughs> right, maneuverability, range, right? So the, the chariot for the chariot, meaning our drone needs to have enough operating range, got to, carry enough fuel so that means that there's drone plus payload plus fuel so that's usually determined by two things and the range is going to be determined by your fuel it's also going to be determined by your engines and also all the crap that you got to carry because the thing is it doesn't just have to carry itself it's got to carry your payload got to carry all that weight has to be able to get that stuff out there and your engines you know are, are you know there's efficiency 
Uh, I, E, N. Efficient. Oh God, I can't spell. There. Right. So the thing is that if your engines are are just really really have if they have poor efficiency, they're going to burn up fuel really fast, and you know your your vehicle will get lighter as it runs out of payload and fuel. But you know this is an interesting thing, right? Is that there's just kind of a neat little cyclic relationship. Right, so you got range to deal with. You got engines. Oh, another thing, heat. Heat's a big thing. Heat's a big deal. You know, it's like if if you have a drone and the drone has brain, or maybe it has eyes. So if it has, if it has sensors like cameras and stuff, and it has a brain, you know, your little CPU or whatever, if it has brain, and then you have engine, great powerful rocket engine that goes. It's going to throw off a lot of heat. And if the heat starts to overheat the brain and it starts to overheat the eyeballs, you're going to lose sensors and nothing's going to fall out of the air, right? So heat's a big fucking deal. Heat's a big deal. It means that you need to give this thing, you know, you need to give it some kind of, you know, tailpipe, a hairy butt or whatever, so that it can, it can, it can vent, it can, it needs to be able to vent the heat out somehow. <laughs> okay you gotta be able to deal with heat heat sinks fans to blow that shit off heat pipes um carburetor uh, not, what, oh, not carburetor, radiator you need radiators you gotta be able to radiate that heat off and you gotta be able to also isolate your the brains of the thing from that stuff you also have to isolate the heat from your payload so that you know your rockets don't go off prematurely <laughs> you don't want to cook your rockets <laughs> You cook your rockets, you're gonna blow your load, you know, before you, before you meant, before you even get to the target. I have an iMac. And this thing was updating, and what happens is when it updates, it has a little progress bar, and the progress bar fills to 100%, and it sits there like a dumb shit after an update. And I eventually learned that the reason this was happening is because I had my valve controllers plugged in, and it was charging those things. But the problem is that if those things are plugged in, it won't boot up. <laughs> It'll go like, I don't know what to do with a valve controller. I'll just sit here like a dumb shit. If I had unplugged them and then reboot the thing. Good job, Mac. Okay, so anyway, um, yeah, valve knuckles controllers. The thing is, like, I literally use that thing as a charging station and then maybe to browse YouTube. That's all it's good for. So, yeah, this systems design stuff, right? Getting pretty, pretty deeply into that. We haven't even talked about the rockets very much. I mean, we've talked a little bit about, like, actually, no, I mean, we've talked about the warheads of the thing. We haven't talked about like the um the actual design of those rockets. You know, it, it takes a long time for us to even get to the point where we even get to talk get to talk about the rockets. So yeah, all right. As again, as a reward for sticking with me this long. Let's point that thing somewhere that's not at my groin. Let's just design a rocket launcher, okay? So, a bunch of things that go on when you design a rocket. And this is all just fictional design. So, none of this stuff is like, don't worry, military. No one's going to be able to use any of this knowledge to actually make real weapons. Don't worry, YouTube. Please don't, like, okay, whatever. Fuck it. Not like they ever use common sense. Okay, so, here. Here's your warhead. Burp. Whatever it is, let's say it's some kind of explosive. It goes kaboom. Well, explosives don't typically... Explosives have to be stable. Like, they don't just have to be explosive. They gotta be stable. If you use, like, nitroglycerin and you, like, give that stuff a shake, it goes... That's no good. 
So it, explosives need a bunch of things. Number one, they got to have yield. Right, there's a certain amount of kilotons of, of TNT. Explode. You need a certain amount of yield. Then there's energy density. I'm going to say E density. Right, you don't want something that is going to explode with the energy density of a lump of coal. Or rather, well, actually, no, coal has a fair amount of energy density. The problem is that when you, it doesn't detonate, it burns slowly. It gives off energy, a lot of energy over a long period of time. So energy density, but you also need things like the, uh, the rate. So rate of, of um, I don't know, the rate of giving up energy basically it's 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 explode explode per second <laughs> okay coal has a very steady and it has a very low explode per second all right dynamite has a much higher explode per second it's it's that's that that that's the main difference. Is that I I'd say even that you know, coal has a tr they both have tremendous energy densities, but the difference is that one of these things is consumed very very quickly and gives off a lot of exploding per second. So, yeah, consider that. And so like C four C four explosive. So composition four. It's got. Very, very high exploding per second. But you want to know another funny thing about that stuff? Is it's incredibly stable. Like, apparently you can take like a little a little piece of it and you can set it on fire and it'll burn like a candle for a very, very long time. It won't go... Like, I know they use this stuff for, you know, demolitions purposes. It's really powerful shit. You use, you know, in a shape charge, you probably punch a hole through a tank. But it's very stable. So you can set the stuff on fire and it will just sit there and it will just burn merrily and cheerily for a very long time. So stability. All right, so I guess we call this the explosive filler. All right, these are, these are all very, very important components of your explosive, whatever the hell it is making. So this means that if you're in a fictional setting, right, you can, if you're in a, okay, if you're going to use a setting which takes and draws ideas from our world, then you can do your own research and you can use something like C4 explosives. You, you know, you can, you can take some, you can just do research. Research is, is what allows you to just take the stuff that conventional knowledge and apply it to your fiction. So that's one way to do it. The other way to do it is if you're working with some fantasy setting, then you can say, well, okay, we don't have C4, but we do have these, these magical crystals that we dug out of the ground and we grind them up and mix them with some, dinosaur magical dinosaur dragon poo it it makes something kind of like c4 from another world okay it makes isekai c4 okay you can do things that way as well you can you can come up with your own little process for coming up with c4 and this is again what but if you don't want things to feel generic right then things feel you, you're going to try and explain how things are done differently in your world and, and, and it has to be convincing. I won't say realistic, it just has to be convincing. So, yeah. So anyway, yeah, there's the stability of this explosive. And so if, here's, here's the other problem. Is that, yeah, we want it to be stable so that when we launch the thing, and if the thing gets struck by a bullet, it doesn't blow up. But we do need it to blow up when it needs to blow up. So what we do is we also, also often have some kind of other detonator. A detonation mechanism and the detonation mechanism is like a blasting cap for for dynamite like again dynamite's pretty stable usually you need a little firecracker to set the thing off some kind of i don't know silver azide or whatever the hell it is a silver fulminator you need something that's that's like a little a little bang to get the thing going so you often have a detonator and then the detonator is used to catalyze the explosion so now here's the problem you put the detonator next to a hunk of explosive well, you'll notice that the contact area between the two is like just this little, <laughs> that's it. Not a lot. It means that what will happen is that your explosion will begin here and then it will gradually propagate out to the back. Yes. 
Yes, Neil. The shape of the of the explosive and the shape of the detonator actually matter. You can get better explos- explosive yield. You can make better use of your explosive with how the detonator meets the explosive. So, I mean, there are things you can do. You could have it, have it so that your detonation, your detonator is like actually a long little stick. Sometimes you have a detonator that's a long little stick and then you put your explosive, you know, to the sides of it like this. You could do something like that. And so that way when you, when your detonator goes off, right, it, it, it has much more surface contact area and causes the explosion to occur faster. Sometimes you need the explosion to be faster. Sometimes it's slower. It really depends. You know, you could also have something where um, maybe we could have multiple sticks, multiple sticks, multiple explosive, all this stuff, you know, affects the rate at which the thing blows up. So you have kind of an explosive hamburger. <laughs> and then you also still need, need a way to fuse this stuff off. Plus you need a way to arm, you know, arm the thing and, and also make sure that there's, there's like maybe, maybe some kind of, you know, arming ne- mechanism, like a switch or something like that, right? You don't want to, you don't want the thing to go off prematurely, right? You need some way to, and, and sometimes even if you want to get even more fancy about like really making sure this whole thing doesn't blow up in your face and prematurely is you take those sticks of, of explosive. So in this case, here's our explosive, here's our detonator. And what we do instead is that just prior to using the damn thing, Right, we have a an ex, here's our detonator plug. Then we, you know, just prior to using it, then we secure. We put the two things together. And I think this is very often, you know, when you play a game and they use the RPG, what they do is they take the whole RPG, they they stick into the the thing, turn it, and then and then they just you know jam the rocket and throw it. Like it turns out, if you do your research, it'll turn out that there's actually more steps to this. A lot of times, some of those steps include things like taking this arming rod and putting it in the thing, putting the detonator together. You got to assemble the rocket, and then it's ready to go. And then you know, then you can pull out the arming pin, and then you can shoot the thing off. They have a lot of safeguards to make sure the thing doesn't blow up in your fucking face. And oftentimes, they don't keep these rockets in an armed state, so that if somebody accidentally drops the fucking thing and it lands on its nose, it doesn't blow up everybody's legs around. So again. This is this is attention to detail. This is the attention to detail, and this is I won't say this is how you become original, okay? Because all this stuff has been thought out before. But this is how you avoid genericism. You avoid the generic. This is how you do it. You know about your subject, or you thought about it, and again, there's a lot of there's a lot. All the generic stuff that's out there are just people that just wanna they wanted to draw. They had dreams of being an artist, and they're fulfilling those dreams. They're they're illustrating now but they don't have any story ideas and they don't know what's going on behind it. So, right. You got to figure out your detonator. You got to figure out your, your explosives. The explosive is the thing that, that does the big boom. The detonator is the thing that sets it off. And then on top of that, you know, you may have a trigger, right? So sometimes your, your trigger may have, maybe there's some little doodad that has to hit this little detonator and, you know, your trigger mechanism is some kind of weird little spring thing with like a little firing pin and like there's a little thing where if it mashes into the firing pin, it smashes the firing pin into the detonator and it sets off the detonator. The thing's like a Rube Goldberg machine, okay? It needs, it's a contraption. It's, you're inventing a contraption that's going to set off the detonator, which sets off the explosive. And then once again, that little you know firing mechanism, oftentimes they have like little safety pins and stuff. You, the safety pin blocks the, the firing pin from going back and smacking the thing. You yank that pin out, now it's armed. Now it's ready to go. That's what a safety is. Arming the thing means taking the safeties out and rendering it ready to go. Go time, baby. So yeah, that we've we've talked all about that that warhead. And there's the warhead. There's the trigger triggering mechanism. The detonators. There's a payload. And then finally, you know, we have maybe some buffer material because if we're going to put this thing inside a rocket, and we want the hot stuff to eventually you know, not set off our warhead when the thing runs out. This is another question, right? What are you, are you, are you trying to abide by Geneva Convention so that the, you want to leave a whole bunch of UXO on the field? UXO stands for Unexploded Ordnance. That means that it's a dud missile. The missile didn't hit something. It never blew up. It's sitting around on the ground. It's a dud. But you know, 
<laughs> if the thing is still armed, the trigger is still, you know, good to go. The detonator is still good to go. And it's kind of a problem is that there's a lot of countries, you know, war-torn countries or places that used to have war in the past. And they got these, you know, problems of having to demine and, and they got a bunch of like UXO sitting around ready to blow off some villagers foot the moment they step on this stuff. So you got to watch out for things like UXO. So maybe what you have is that you have a little, maybe you have another little back plug here, a little device that, that's here. It's, an, it's a secondary detonator. So that means that if your fuel burns up to the point where it hits this thing, it sets that thing off and then this thing goes. So that means that if it either is triggered by the, the, the fuse in the front or the fuse in the back, it blows up. And I mean, aside from, you know, abiding by Geneva conventions and it's the right thing to do. The other reason you do it is so that you don't, your powerful explosives do not wind up in the hands of the enemy. Meaning if they were to ever to recover these fucking things, these explosives, and then, you know, brush them off, dust, brush off the dust and refurbish the thing and then send them back at you. That's a real prop because oftentimes in a war, wars are very often like conventional warfare is often a war of attrition. It means that people are running out of, you know, materials and they're running out of, you know, supplies, they're running out of money, they're running out of, you know, personnel, they're running out of, out of who knows what, right? So the thing is that oftentimes if you can take the enemy's, um, you know, their ordinance, you can dust it off and send it back at them. Like, that's great. That's, that's, that's a whole lot of crap that you didn't have to go through. <laughs> you took their very own weapons and you sent them back at them. And I know that, like, you know, during World War One, World War Two, like, very often they have these little posters up when they were saying, hey, people, you know, like, we need your, we need your bone scraps. We need your bone scraps and your fat and, and, and this other stuff so that we can render this stuff down and turn them into nitro. We can turn it into nitroglycerin. Turn it into which can then be turned into gun into like in, into TNT, right? They 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 needed the materials. They needed the materials. So very often, if you have a long drawn out war, you know, it, it becomes important to actually be able to secure enemy explosives and turn them around and use them at them. So if you don't want to help the enemy out in a war of attrition, then maybe you might want to have self exploding munitions that don't leave UXO lying around for the enemy to throw back at you. So, right, there's, there's triggers and fuses. Triggers is one, fuse is another. You've got things like contact fuses, contact, or sorry, contact triggers. So they have different types, right? So there's contact. That means that when the thing bangs into the enemy, it goes off. There's other ones which are like proximity. And the proximity detection sometimes is magnetic. I, I think it very often times in the case of, uh, well, I know that like, like contact triggers, if you look at like a water mine, right? Like a naval water mine, oftentimes they have all these like kind of weird protrusions sticking out all over them. They're not spikes, but they're kind of like, you know, spike like protrusions. Okay, so really, if we were to look at one of these things closely, what happens is that you have these kinds of things like this, and there's a long rod like that, and this rod pokes out. And if this rod, you know, bangs into the hull of something, if it bangs into the hull of a ship, you know, that, that rod gets driven in, you know, there's a spring, it's a spring-loaded thing. So it gets driven in to hit your detonator, and that sets off the, the, the water mine, right? That's a contact trigger. Pretty, pretty, pretty simple, very, very simple, and pretty effective. Um, then you've got, and, and here's another thing is that if you want to get really, really into the, the gudgeons of things, sometimes what you have is a relay. So a relay means in the case of, let's say, a, you know, firing a gun, all right, you're going to fire, let's say a revolver, a good old revolver. You have your bullet, which has the primer, the primer is, is basically a de is basically the detonator for the gunpowder. And so you have your bullet out here, and then you also have your explosive gunpowder filter, and this is your primer. And then oftentimes in the case of a revolver, the hammer directly strikes that, that primer. And the, the hammer's on some kind of fucking spring or whatever, right? That's direct. The other way to do things, however, is you have a firing pin, 
this firing pin is on its own little spring mechanism to smack that thing. And this, this thing, this firing pin is on under considerable stress, ready to go. But then you have a little thing that prevents the firing pin from driving forward. And it just has a little sear. It's a little, it's a little, little hook that just, you know, if you pull that hook out of the way, then the firing pin is free, freed to go. And so what this does, is this allows you to use a considerably lesser force, a much, you know, if you pull on this thing, it only takes a little bit of force to draw that thing down to release a larger force, right? So you got a big spring force to smack that thing on the back, but it only takes a teeny little force, a little bit of force to pull that thing out of the way. So this is a relay system is that you would use something like that. So in the case of, you know, a big mine like this, you might not need to drive a whole giant iron stake into your explosive what you do is that iron stake when it moves and it may only have to move a little bit sets off a little trigger with a little sear on it and that little sear is what sets it off so because you know if you hit the thing too hard you might wind up breaking your explosive before it goes off so consider that uh, proximity i'm not really sure how a lot of proximity stuff works i imagine that like when it comes to magnetic mines uh and probably not using naval but maybe using um in the case of like anti-tank mines, right? You could have a really powerful magnet here and the magnet is held up against a spring or something like that. And then the, the magnet itself controls a sear mechanism, right? With a, so your sear mechanism here, actually, let's see. I'm just thinking about how that would work. Okay, yeah. So maybe there's little sears like this and this thing is sprung to go that way and then you've got like an explosive or something like that. Right, so the idea is that if your magnet gets pulled up, then it will it'll undo the sear and then it will go off. So if a tank rolls over this thing, right, with a big hunk of its metal, it's going to attract the magnet upwards. That's a proximity sensor. It doesn't require actual contact. It just needs a strong enough metal force for the magnet to rise up. It's a it's like a, a scale, I guess. So there's different there's different kinds. You'll have to figure something out. Maybe your fantasy proximity mine works by way of having a little monster eyeball and the monster eyeball is on a photoreceptor and may, or maybe it's like it's a it's a monster flea and the flea jumps towards hot things and you tie a little string to the thing so when it jumps towards the you know the hot dinosaur creature then it it, it pulls a sear mechanism and boom the thing goes off so there's that another thing about the explosives is that the shape of the explosive matters Right. So that funny thing is that if you take a shape and you have a as a big pancake, right, it, like that has a different effect from a piece of shape, uh, uh, an explosive that's been shaped like a ring. You leave the, the center open versus a, an explosive that is made as a long rod. OK, now, no, we're OK, you guys. I mean, you're already on a list, but, you know, this is just going to make it worse. The shape of the explosion actually causes the explosion to be directed in different ways. So sometimes you can make shape charges which whose purpose is just to cut through like, you know, walls and it cuts out a shape out of the wall and cookie cutters the thing out. It's pretty cool. There's, you can find out about this stuff on YouTube. It's all been demonetized. I tell you, man, the for forbidden fruit's like the most fascinating stuff. So, you know, as to not lose sight of the big picture, you know, consider what are you targeting on your enemy drone? If you're going to use explosives, in this case, if it's the airframe in the hull of the chassis, try and think about, you know, how it is that you're going to direct your little explosive jet at the enemy. You've got things like, you know, heat, high explosive anti-tank warheads, you know, and those things use shape charges, and they shoot like jets of molten metal. <laughs> They're pretty awesome. Um, you know, there's the heat, heat rounds, there's Hesh rounds, high explosive squash heads. There's rounds that were made so that when they, in the olden days, they would make it so that the Hesh rounds would have us, they would squash some explosive in the shape of like a plunger onto the side of the, uh, the tank. And then when that stuff blew up, what it did is it applied a concussion to the outside of the armor and that concussion would rattle onto the inside of the armor and it would cause the armor to spall, spalling. It causes it to fragment and those little pieces would go and it would ricochet inside and, and dice up the crew into pizza, into pizza toppings. And um, so that's like Hesh foreheads. And now, nowadays, a lot of tanks have something called a spall liner, where they actually have this kind of, a, I don't know, like a Kevlar mesh on the inside to catch the spall. 
catch any of the spawning fragments so that your armor doesn't get turned against you. So there's all kinds of like interesting things to, be, to learn about this stuff. So yeah, like I say, I mean, this is a very fertile topic. I can talk about, we've probably been talking about this shit for hours. What time is it now? Yeah, it's, it has literally been an hour long. Thing. Okay. Right. So, I mean, your missile, your missile has, I'm going to try and fast forward through some of this stuff. You've got your propellant. The propellant, and you have different types of propellant. You've got propellant to get the missile to the target. So there's the long burning to the target stuff. You also have the stuff which is just to get the stuff out of the launcher. Gave you your launching propellant. So, you know, it's just something to just like kick it out of the tube. This is why a lot of times, you know, bazookas would have like this big opening on the back. And they make it so that, you know, a lot of the blast gets knocked out this way. If you're standing back there, that thing will kill you or it'll throw you really far. It will injure you severely. And that is just to get the missile out, out of the thing. And then what happens is that there might be a little string or a wire or something like that, which sets this thing off. Or there may be a secondary fuse. There may be a little fuse in here that, that lights off the propellant here. So sometimes with these missiles, they put two things. They put in a propellant charge to kick the thing out of the tube. And then there's another little fuse that, that gets set off and that sets off the proper rocket engine so that you don't get like, you don't want the main rocket motor to turn on in your face. You want to kick that thing far enough away and then have that thing pick up. This is why oftentimes when you see missiles, there are actually two things. There's two things that'll happen. There's like a, there's like a pa -pa chunk and the thing flies out and then the thing flies up for a bit and it falls for a bit and it goes and then it takes off. So you, you know, they don't want to have people getting roasted. For a man pad, man portable, you know, anti, uh, or aerial defenses. Uh, man, yeah, man pads. Those are like, those are the man portable, you know, launched missiles. Those things, you know, you'll see that they, there's like a one launch, they fall for a bit and then they go and they take off. So sometimes you need that. You need that launch propellant to, take, to, to watch it. You have to make sure that, you know, you don't want to kill your soldier who he must live on to launch many more missiles. So those are things to consider. Um, other things to consider are retaining the missile, meaning that if you turn your missile, if you turn your launcher downwards, you don't want the thing to like come rolling out the front, especially if your missile's been armed, right? It's like, you're, let's say you're, you're standing on some cliff face with an RPG-7D and you're aiming down at some tank that's way down there, right? You don't want your missile to like fall out and land at your feet. You're aiming at some tank off a cliff. <laughs> <laughs> this is a problem. So, you know, you need things to, like, retain the missile. Um, if we're talking about maybe more futuristic systems, then something can be as, as complex as you have... Okay, actually, no, let's build around the missile. So we have our missile here. Uh, maybe the missile actually has guidance. Oh, shit. That, that adds on, like, another layer of stuff. So if your missile actually has is not just a, a dumb missile that flies forward, you've got your explosive, but you also have to have some optics. There's like a little, you know, camera eye there. This thing then needs to have some space for a computer, right? And not only that, your computer must be made in such a way that it can somehow fit and not displace too much of your stuff. Maybe you build your computer in like a ring. You have a ring unit like this. So you have a toroid and then some of your stuff can go down the center of that thing, but that toroid can be split up and you can have different modules in this ring. So you have a certain amount of footprint for the CPU, for, for, the, for the, the thinking circuitry of this thing. So in this case, I'm going to build it in as a toroid and it's going to do its thinky, thinky stuff. It's going to have some image processing stuff. There also needs to be stuff where um, your, your fighter pilot or your drone even your pilot needs to send some targeting computer information. So maybe there's some contact. There's a little bit of contact made between these two. So this way that this way the, the targeting computer can talk to the computer on the missile and say, all right, you know, we open up the little hatch and we allow the, the missile to look at the target with its own its own camera. And then 
we also send it additional targeting information to make sure that the missile is like, okay, hey, missile, do you see that target? And the missile's like, oh, yeah. It's like, wait, there's two targets. Are you sure that you're looking at the right target? Because, you know, that beyond the other target is my friend who I don't want to shoot. Just the missile kind of has to make a confirmation, gets a proper acquisition and says the missile, you get an acquisition and a target lock. So the missile confirms and says, okay, all right, I am seeking to hit that target. I know what it looks like. Okay, we're ready to go. Then we can cut the guidance cable or rather, you know, we just have something which is in metal contact. So when the missile goes flying up, the contact is cut. Uh, we also have to set off, you know, maybe we got to set, set off the propellant charge to kick the, out you go, right? We got to birth the baby and kick it out, kick it out of the tube. And then also there's that little fuse plus the main propellant charge that goes off. Also, our computer may have to talk to some fins. Maybe we have, if, if we're in in an aerial, if we're in an atmosphere, then we have fins. Otherwise, if we're in outer space, we have things like thrusters. So thruster jets are little things that, that go boop, boop, and they fart. And they redirect the missile by pooping, by farting, farting, farting and pooping. And then sometimes you may also have things like vector thrust. So vector thrust is when you have a motor drive or maybe you have a bunch of little fins and veins. And what you do is you flex them in different ways to like redirect the thrust to cause the missile to turn to steer it. So we're going to steer it until it reaches the target and then Bob's your uncle. But once you, the thing about this missile is that the fins kind of get in the way of the launching. So we have folding fins. And we wrap, we fold them against the body or we retract them inside somehow. And then we have a, a launch tube. And our launch tube, again, must have retainment. We must not let the missile go falling out, out, the, out the front. So sometimes what they do is they put on um, a disposable blasting. Like there's, a, there's, a, there's, some, there's some doors on the front, some retainment doors on the front. So that dust, you don't want dirt and dust if you're flying in ter terrestrial environments or any space dust and stuff. You don't want that stuff getting in there, fouling your missile. And then your missile is live and hot and burning and stuck in the missile chamber that's bad so a lot of times you have these plastic doors that are sealed on place but they're made very breakable there may even be secondary charges that blast this shit out they blast that shit out they blast that shit out of the way when, when the moment that the thing is launching you may also have additional blast doors like breakable breakable doors on the back in case you're going to blast any exhaust out here from the from the to launch that way your whole ship doesn't get destabilized when you launch the missiles just just things to consider and then you know lastly you, if you know if you really want to be like super anal and really you don't want your missiles to get shot from the front then maybe you have armored doors over the front like that right so there's an armored hatch so when you're when your pilot is now aiming at the enemy when he partial when he puts his finger on the trigger this door gets moved up out of the way and there's probably some kind of fail-safe sensor which detects, you know, shit, is this door jammed? Because if it's jammed, we better not launch that fucking missile. And if it does get jammed, maybe what we do is we also have additional exploding bolts. We have little explosive bolts. We can send a, an electrical charge of them and blast this door free. We can, it's like, it, it's expensive. But, you know, if we really need to launch that fucking missile and the thing is somehow jammed or fouled, at least we can knock the thing free and we can still launch our missile. We can still get our load off. And so these things like this, this disposable um, cover disc, you know, may look kind of like this. It might look like, uh, might have a shape kind of like this. So these little X's, this little X shape that you see, that's a weakening. These are dimples that they put in the door. They make the material thinner. They make it easier to break. It's a weakening that they do on the door. It's a, it's a, it's a structural weakening to make sure that the thing, when the thing breaks, it, it, it breaks in the center and fractures along these lines on purpose and then it it may bust and it'll bust out in this pattern right because you don't want these the, you need the door out of the way so that it doesn't foul the fucking thing you don't want it to foul the missile so it will break away in, in in a pattern like that and you need it to fly and break away clear so you know a missile pack a missile pack of let's say four missiles or you know you can have as many of these, these things as you want right from the front it might look kind of like this you have these little breakaway discs little breakaway doors looks kind of like that 
It's not just a detail. It's not just some like random, you know, funky detail. It actually serves a purpose. So again, this is one of those things that helps you get away from the generic is when you understand why, why it has these things. Okay. So yeah, that was, that was pretty long. We're just going to end it here. Fuck outros. Bye guys.